first we were like, so at first we were like, we thought we'd have to maybe charge an extra 50, 60 pounds a month for the service to people, but then we were like, no, 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 let's, how do we do it, you know? Um, and we found a way in the end, right? It's not perfect, it's a bit clunky here and there, but like, that's what we do, it's always a work in progress. And the same thing in our gyms, it's like, how can we give more value to people but without increasing the cost for them? That's the real thing a company does, of giving value to its client, giving value as a company, it's, it really is like, how do you give the most value and make it accessible to the highest number of people and you burden the costs for the customers? How do you have lean cost efficiencies in your business? That's the hard work is making everything so streamlined, so efficient, so back-end focused that you can then afford to pass those savings on to the customer. You think Netflix could charge double if it wanted to? Of course they could, but they don't for a reason, right? Um, you know, and then it's like Amazon strategy. The reason Amazon created uh, the S3 web services is because you know Amazon work on such tiny margins. Because Jeff Bezos like, wants to over deliver and give you absolutely everything as cheap as it could possibly be, that he has a massive business on razor thin like three percent profit margins. Um, and you know Amazon didn't make a penny of profit for the first seven years. He had um, like I think over three thousand em employees before he'd even made a profit in that company. And we freak out today if we're three months in and haven't got a pro you know, we, haven't, we can't afford our own sports car yet. You know, Jeff Bezos went built Amazon the first seven years, he had 3,000 employees to pay before the company had made a penny in profit. Right, because he just put all the money plowed into like delivering more value to the, to the team and met employees and passing on savings to the customer, right? And then, because of the narrow margin issue as it gets bigger, that gets a bit dangerous, so they then leveraged the S3 service selling storage because they already had that. They had that infrastructure, the asset already built. And they just said, you know, it wouldn't cost us much to open this up and to sell it at scale to the public without our costs going up because it's just it's data. It doesn't, it doesn't take up warehouse space, you know? Uh, and that now is a very high margin element of their business. And so, you know, the shareholders thought Jeff Bezos was crazy first. They thought he's losing his focus, he's diversifying. We're not in the B2B data storage space. And he was like, I know we're not, but this is what allows us at low, low resistance, low leverage. It allows us the wider margins to overcompensate for giving the customers the main core service at Amazon. You know, so just looking at things like that, you know, when you start bringing supplements and merchandise into your businesses and selling these things at high margins, will allow you then to bring your training core product costs and deliver that USP, that value proposition, at, at a more efficient price for the customer so more people can do it. You know, And again, this is gonna be very important going forward because you have to look what's going on around you guys. You have to play the long term, right? We've been through the age, and I was charging 99 pound a month boot camps way before it was popular and feasible, right? And there was a lot of education to do on the market, a lot of like sales copy, positioning work, and all the rest of it. But that market is becoming and getting diluted because the big gym chains are aiming hard right now to take a stab at the boutique market, and they're going to drive your cost down. They are because they're going to open up these plush places now, like you know the, the big gym etcetera's, and they're going to offer. Well, they're going to say to the customer, they offer what you offer. Oh, come and do our transformation program for 29 pounds, they're gonna do it, you know? And they're not gonna deliver what you deliver, but by the time the customers have already gone over there, it's too late. They are gonna water down the market and charging higher rates for your bootcamp is, is gonna get harder, especially when you've got more competitors around you as well. So, you know, the, you, can't, you can't race to the bottom on prices, but you can't race to the top either. You can't just be better at sales copy and charge more again because you're gonna price yourself out of a market, and a market that's changing, right? Especially hitting a downturn as well in the economy. So, you know, again, we're, we're telling people in our companies, it's like, right, how can we really get good at giving a, giving a very reasonable price for our bootcamp or PT, and, and still make profit, you know, even if we charge less than average sometimes. Like this FPV model, right? You know, people on the outside are scratching their heads. Like, Justin, how can you charge average of 360 a month and give people one-to-one -one mentoring and two retreats 
and several live meetups in the UK every year. They're like, how is that, how are we not charging, you should charge 20 grand for that. And they're scratching their heads, right? Um, but the truth about the high ticket coaching business is, people are telling you to you know, do the high ticket prices and that, that's just because you know, they need you to charge those prices so you can keep afford and pay them, right? You know? But the real business longevity is how can you actually keep things lean? Right, it's not feasible for me to start, you know, for me to tell you guys, like, watch your cash flow and this and then charge you like five grand a month. It's absurd, right? And that's where those, those places have low longevity and now the market, the FitPro market is really shifting away from that bullshit. You know, the, the five grand for a, to learn how to play with click funnels for, for a month or whatever. People have seen right through that now. They've paid all the money. They've been burned on these super high ticket programs, 20K a year masterminds and shit like that. You know, and it's irresponsible for me to charge you guys like that kind of money because you need to put that back in your business. You know, um, that was that was something like that. my mentor Yasin first said to me, right? Because back a few years when I started working with him, it was like my desire is to have a hundred k a year program because I'd fall into all this bullshit online with the charge what you're worth and have a hundred k mastermind and all this fucking bollock bollocks, you know. And I said to him, this is my plan, I want to build up in the coaches market and have a 100k mastermind where people have the privilege of paying me 100 grand a year. And he was like, he just said, he was like, if I had, if I had a, he's like, if I have a nine figure business and I wouldn't pay a consultant 100 grand a year. He's like, that's a massive cost to a business. He's like, so he's like, I've got a nine figure company and I wouldn't pay you that. Not because it's not worth it, but it's just because, well, I, would, I wouldn't pay 20 quid for a cup of coffee either. It's just. It's just not feasible, right? It's irresponsible to charge someone that much, right? Even if you can make them the money back, it's like, it's, it's just not, it's not, it has no longevity to that model, you know? He's like, and so you're working with people that have a six figure business or less, and you expect them to pay, to pay you like a hundred grand a year and not go into debt over it? And you see it, you hear about it, right? You've all heard of stories, people they go into debt, paying these mentors and gurus and coaches like 10 grand and all in these, they're, they're recovering for years after paying off these huge things. Um, and, and so, again, we, we want to move away from that, it, the, the high ticket pricing position, it doesn't have longevity to it. You want to look at ways of, again, how can you keep your costs lean and reasonable even, and be prepared for when, if you do get undercut or the prices are driven down in your, in your area, uh, which they will as everything gets saturated, you know. Um, it, it, might, it might be worth looking at how to compete at a slightly lower price if you need to. Or having options there, like downsell options at a lower price if you give people as a diet version of what you do. You know? So no, no one's really looking at that, but I think it's, I think it's quite an important thing coming up in the years to come. That's it. I could be wrong. It's just a prediction. I could be wrong about all of this. But... <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, Nicole, you want to go next? Um, so, we, as I said earlier, have two studios in Hertfordshire. Um, we have just under 500 members, but, which looks really great and successful on the outside, but we've been at the point for a, a while now, probably in the last 18 months, where we're paying out as much as we're it's really close. Our expenses now turn out are really close. Okay. Um, and it's just like, what do I do? What do I want to do? So I've had quite a lot of time to think about, do I want to let this go? Or okay. Okay, so it's a cash flow. It's a cash flow situation, cash yeah. Flow. And that, that's the same for most people, right? You're not alone. 99% of companies come to me, I say, you've got a cash flow issue. They either know it's a cash flow issue, or they think it's something else, which is actually a cash flow issue, right? <laughs> it's kind of, you know, um, so you know, if, if profit is king, cash flow is god in your business, right? Cash flow is more important than profit, essentially. Um, so, I mean, what I say to this usually is, uh, you have cash flow. A cash flow problem when we look at investing is that you have you are paying for assets. Well, you're paying for something, right? You're paying for different things. You've got the high expenses. You're paying for things which are maybe liabilities right now, which could be flipped into assets. So you are paying for, your business is acquiring assets and 
profitability means you're not exploiting those assets well enough yet. You're not monetizing what you already have. And your cash flow uh, goes down, your spend goes up when you try to buy more assets outside rather than dealing with the ones you have. Or, you're, you're, or it gets expensive when you attempt to build an asset or buy an asset from scratch. So I'll explain what the assets are in a second, but most here's the fundamental thing in business or investing. Business or investing is uh, you make money on assets you own, right? You will succeed fastest and most profitably as a company when you start by identifying what assets you already have and you leverage those assets. What most companies, entrepreneurs do though, is they identify which assets they don't have and they immediately go out there and try and work or borrow or buy or build those assets, which is extremely expensive. Now, if you want the asset of a house, you want a, you want a, you want a house, right? A property. You can buy the house, you can borrow money for the house, or you can build it yourself. Which is the worst of those options? Building it yourself, borrowing money for it, or buying it outright, assuming you have the money? Depends. On? On your skills. So you can build a house, go and build it yourself if you've got the equipment. And skills are an asset, right? Yeah. Equipment's an asset, so yeah, that's, that's a trick question. Man. <laughs> but yeah, so you see, like, so that's one way to look at it, right? So if you're a builder, you have the skills, you have the tools, go and build it, right? If not, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a long time, right? So the fastest way is identify the assets you have and then the ones you don't have that you need, you go and borrow them or buy them from somebody else, right? Or find them somewhere else, right? Or collaborate and share with somebody else. So the main assets we have in business is six core assets, right? And, and what we find it with, with lack of profitability, it's because these assets are not being identified or, mon or pushed to the fullest, right? The first asset is you, right? So have you identify, first of all, the entrepreneur, and this is the biggest asset, right? It's ultimately you. Do you know like where your time and energy should really be? Are you focusing on the most profit producing activities for the company? And that goes back to what we covered earlier, the entrepreneurial managerial. So you've seen like what Gary's doing now, he's now focusing his time on there, which I've given him a 21 day challenge for, and it's, it's just not stopping, right? Um, that is one element of, are you, are you actually monetizing you, your own asset? And then identifying the skills and you know, uh, those kind of things. So that's number one, is you. And, and you know, on the other hand, like also taking care of you. You're the biggest asset to the company. It kind of lives and dies with you, at least at this point in its growth. So are you taking care of yourself? Are you going to the gym? Are you staying healthy? Are you meditating first thing in the day? Are you emotionally and mentally strong? If not, take care of that, right? Sounds basic, we all know it but I'm telling you to as a, as a business strategy now, right? You are an asset, take care of yourself first, okay? So first thing in the day, always start with you time, you know, have your routine, don't check your phone first thing, go and do everything else, get in a good state, you know, then you can start your entrepreneurial tasks when you start your work day. I don't start work till about three hours after I wake up. Right, so that's number one, that's the first asset is you. Second asset then is your team or you know, the people who are working with you, right? So are you actually, you know, so payroll is a big thing. Most of the pros are overpaying team members. You know, they're giving them way too much money. You know, if you're like paying out a trainer 25 pounds an hour, um, especially most of you guys, you're, you're running a new age model of group training, but you're still relying on a one-to-one -one payroll structure. You know, there's no chance in hell a personal trainer comes to my business and says, I want 20 pounds a session, 20 pounds an hour. I say, fuck right off, right? Our trainers are on you know, between eight and 12 pounds an hour, right? Because we, first of all, don't hire personal trainers. We don't need personal. I'm not a certified personal trainer. I've never got qualified. I've managed okay, right? We don't need PTs. We're not doing one-on-one -on -one highly specialized training. If you are, that, like we're with athletes, that's a bit different. But if you're running like a semi-private or boot camp model, you know, we can get by on a level two fitness qualification um, as long as you know they're not going to kill someone. If they, can, I mean, if someone can count to ten and teach a lunge, I can teach them the rest of the stuff. It's not that complicated, right? And if it is, 
your workouts are too complex. You should be writing all the workouts anyway for them, right? So it's not hard today to find someone who can come in and deliver a good group workout, at least with a bit of training. They don't need a level three certification um, and they don't need the entitlement that comes with that. And if they come in and say, I deserve 25 pounds an hour, it's like, great, yeah, you do for one-on-one -on -one training in a one-on-one -on -one business. This is not that, right? You're not gonna get, McDonald's not gonna pay a gourmet chef what he's worth to put pickles on their burgers. Because you're bringing the systems, you're paying all the, you're taking all the risks. I ain't giving 50% of my revenue to a, to, a, to a team member or contractor, no way, right? Um, and again, that goes back to hiring the right people. And we get, we get the people who are more than happy to work for you know, a flat salary each month. Um, and we aim to make a five to eight X ROI on every team member. So I love the capacity that person can work in. And if, uh, if a trainer or a teacher is uh, responsible, let's say, for, for handling 50 clients, you know, then you look at, and they're retaining those, their job is to retain those clients, then, you know, how much is that worth each month to the business? If it's, if it's 50 clients at a hundred pounds a month, um, there's five grand a month coming to the company. So I can budget, you know, anywhere from 800 to, to, to 1500 a month for that, for that trainer to do that. And that's a start of how we kind of calculate these kind of things. And so I know that, uh, and obviously filling up the 50 clients, that's my responsibility as the owner, not their responsibility. They're not marketers. I don't put that burden on them, right? It's my job to fill those spaces. So they shouldn't have to worry about that. They need to retain them once they're there. So that's your team, making sure that you've got your, you've actually budgeted properly for how to pay your team members on what you can afford, not on just what the going rate is, right? Because the going rate is usually um, too expensive for a lot of companies. Third asset then, you've got you, you've got your team, then you've got your, your client base, right? We've talked this a lot. Can you get more upsells? Can you, could you increase your rates 5%, right? I mean, you know, for new people coming in, could you add more value to the program? Could you maximize client value in some way? You know, you've got, you've got upsell, you can increase upsell value by offering more upsells. You have retention value by making them stay longer. Okay. And then you've got referral value as well. So getting more referrals on average per client. You know, if you just increase those three things, you can exponentially increase the value you get from one customer. Right, it's like every customer is an asset, right? So right now, again, if you're on 100 pounds a month, three month lifetime value, that's 300 pounds value, right? So if you could just do the work like we talked about, we've talked about these strategies, and you can increase retention from an average of three months to five months, you've now gone from 300 pounds to 500 pounds with no additional cost to get that customer, right? If you can then get an average of one referral, one successful, so one, um, let's do upsell value. So let's say you can get then an average upsell value. If you get on average, all your customers upsell, but they pay 20 pounds a month extra for something. It won't be like, it'll be 20% of your audience buy all the stuff. But if you spread that average across your entire client base, maybe it's an equivalent of 120 pounds a month now in upsell value, right? So now you got, uh, so that's gonna be 600 pounds total now. So you got from 300 to 500 retention. It's gone to 600 pounds with upsell value. Then if you can get referral value, if you can get the average client to refer one more successful client, that's worth another 600 pounds. So now that client is actually worth 1,200 pounds, right?